seat on our couch, amen. That should, that should be comfortable and familiar for everybody, I think. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, again, I want to appreciate you all being here and helping us to have this important and relevant conversation. Why don't we just do some quick introductions and you all tell us just a quick little bit about yourself. And uh, for the next 10 minutes, we're just going to engage in a little bit of, little bit of uh, uh, you, you all downloading us and helping us to appreciate and know uh, how we can all uh, dive in and, and uh, be healed from some trauma. So please go ahead. Um, hi, my, hi everyone, good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Jeannie Celestial. I'm a clinical psychologist and licensed clinical social worker. Clap it up for Sister Jeannie, everybody. <laughs> Member of the way, all right, go ahead. Hi, my name is Jonathan Relucio. I'm just grateful to be in a very soulful community. Appreciate that this morning. Um, I work for the Niroga Institute, which is an organization that teaches and trains around mindfulness practice. Uh, we work in public schools, also in juvenile halls, homeless shelters, alcohol and rehab, drug rehab centers. So um, yeah, just training and teaching around mindfulness practices. Let's welcome Brother Jonathan into our community, everyone. Thank God for him. Good morning, my name is Hannah Jones and I am also a clinical psychologist. I guess you can say that because I just graduated. Uh, I work at West Coast Children's Clinic in Oakland. All right, what an extinguished, I mean distinguished panel we have this morning and uh, so glad to have them here. So um, what, Jeannie, why don't you uh, start us off? Uh, you are kind of helping you and Jaslyn to really help pull some of the strings together for uh, this ministry here inside of our congregation. Um, tell us a little bit what mental health is from the standpoint of holistic health, both the mind, the body, and the soul. And uh, as a Christ follower, why is it important for you um, to, to not only uh, be trained in this, but help others really go deep in, in their own healing? Sure, um, I have some notes just in case I don't, so I don't forget anything, but um, so mental health is about our emotional and psychological wellness. Um, it includes our thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Um, so everyone's likely to experience sadness or worry, anxiety at some point in your life. But when the negative thoughts and feelings persist over time, days, weeks, months, even years, and then they get in the way of our functioning, how we operate at work or in our family, then it, it could be considered um, a, a mental health condition or a disorder. Um, it, generally in the population, about 20 to 25% of people will suffer from depression or anxiety sometime in your life. Um, but when, when that happens, you're not alone. Um, and I, I thank you for showing the video. I thought it was very helpful to see real life people su suffering with real life issues. Um, and as a Christ follower, I feel that uh, healing is one of my callings. Um, I decided to pursue social work um, after Berkeley to become a healer. Um, and then after practicing as a therapist and social worker, I felt called to go back for my doctorate. So I too just graduated, so. Yes, 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 yes. Tell us, tell us like what are some things that could trigger um, some crises of, of our mental health or mental illness uh, just, you know, in the course of our, our lives or things that may even trigger depression. Just mm -hmm. like give people a sense of some examples. Yeah, and I know um, Dr. Hannah is going to be addressing that as well so you can chime in. Um, but um, there are many stressors, you know, um, that we face, whether financial, divorce, death in the family. The top stressors um, are divorce, moving, losing a job. Um, so um, especially in our modern world, there are a lot of what we call psychosocial stressors, things that happen in our world that can affect us emotionally and even physically. And, and you asked about holistic health. There's a, a very strong connection between our physical ailments and our emotional mental ailments. And you will find that if you start to address some of your emotional and mental wellness, 
some of the physical symptoms will start to dissipate. And I know Jonathan's quite expert in that. So. All right. Well, that's a good, good setup for you, Brother Jonathan. So talk to us a little bit about, about some of these, these manifestations. I know trauma and, and uh, the many ways trauma impacts our body and our physiological makeup is uh, something that is not always known to us. So can you talk a little about trauma and just some of these uh, different kind of ways that we all need to experience some holistic healing? Yeah, so Niroga's approach to addressing trauma is through mindfulness practice. Just curious, how many folks have experience with mindfulness practices? And All right. Great. And just a question also, how many people... The way y'all mindful. All right. <laughs> yeah, so mindfulness practices are practices that address trauma in the way of... We, we, we practice three different components. Mindfulness practice as mindful movement, um, mindful breathing and mindful centering. So, um, for example, neuroscience tells us that um, mindfulness helps build our capacity to be in the present. So when people experience trauma, then we typically have, they typically have a tendency, or we typically have a tendency when we're experiencing that, to go ahead and replay stories of the past. So what mindfulness practices through breath, through the body, it's like, okay, let's keep bringing us back to this present moment. That's one way in which mindfulness works for people who are experiencing trauma. Another way is through, uh, through movement. So um, the trauma research says that in addition to stories that we get to replay over and over again, another thing is that the actual issues, the experiences that we experience in that traumatic event get stored in our, uh, our tissues, and our organs, in our body. So through movement, we get to go ahead and have the opportunity to release that tension, release that, um, those, those, ex those sensations that have been imprinted into our hormonal and arousal systems caused by the traumatic event through movement, through mindful movement with breathing. And then another thing that we can go ahead and do is actual called mindful centering. And mindful centering activates this part of our brain um, called the prefrontal medial cortex in our brain. And there's a distinction between, with folks who are experiencing trauma, between I am feeling mad and I am mad. So if you think about those two, what would be like the one that's most adaptive for moving forward? Any guesses? I am mad versus I am feeling mad? I am feeling mad, right? So the more we engage that part of our brain through mindful centering, meaning like, oh, I'm noticing the sensations in my body right now, in my muscles, in my tissues, the more we engage that part of our brain, the more we can go ahead and distinguish ourselves from who we are from our emotions. That makes sense, yeah. So those are the three components that we use in our practices, and I can go ahead and demonstrate uh, like a two or three minute practice later on um, that we integrate uh, to, to address all those three levels. Uh, how many would like, we, we could close out with a quick mindfulness thing, you know, at the end. And, and I think this is so important, right, because uh, growing up in like the Pentecostal church I grew up in, we talked a lot about being possessed by, you know, spirits and demons and all kind of things, right? And this kind of puts another twist on that, right? That, that, that you know, our body is actually storing trauma. Touch your neighbor, somebody, right? And so some of the work that God would have us do is actually be depossessed by our trauma. I feel like preaching up in here, right? Like get, get rid of some of this stuff that's stored up inside of us. And he'll give us some practices at the end for us to do that. And I want us to imagine some of these practices to be very much uh, a part of our spiritual discipline, just like fasting, just like prayer. Like these practices can help us depossess from some trauma. Sister Hannah, now you working in the neighborhood and working with young people and as an African-American woman uh, who certainly I think can speak a little bit to some of the unique conditions that many of our communities are dealing with. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how are you helping young people and what are some of the experiences, I don't know if you have a story or two to share that can actually help many of us who have children or young folks or even ourselves. How can we help support folks and even maybe even ourselves enter into some of these places of healing? Yeah. I think it's such an important question because when you talk about trauma and its effects, um, the video pointed out and you pointed out so well that it runs deep. And I think that you know the video made the point that we're resilient and we have the ability to heal and recover, but it requires us to be able to reach out. And there's a way that I've seen this in children and in the youth, but also in adults and in everyone really, there's a way that trauma 
um, silos us and convinces us that we can't be connected when we're actually created to be relational beings. And so when we, you know, convince ourselves that we can't reach out, especially we have this kind of cultural value of being strong and putting up a good front, when we deprive ourselves of the ability to connect to someone else in order to promote healing, we deprive ourselves of the ability to kind of reconcile and to, to recover. Um, and that's one of the ways that it kind of comes out. It can also come out, like you said, physically. Um, we can get stomach aches and headaches just from the stress of trying to cope. Um, someone who was previously happy um, uh, might now feel angry, sad, depressed, anxious most of the time. Your thinking might change. You might see the world as a dangerous place and be looking for danger in every corner. Um, you might have questions and choice words for God. You might wonder, you know, if you're a good God, why would you have put me in this situation? You know, why would you have allowed this to happen? And there are real impacts. You know, it's also important to remember that the impacts of trauma go beyond just the individual. You know, there are traumas that are so deep that they impact entire communities, any genocide, racism, ongoing war, these are things that impact more than just one person and each person's trauma then gets linked and becomes kind of a web of trauma. But we have, like I said, the ability to recover and to, to shift and we do that through connection with one another. So let's, wow, that was, wasn't that great, wasn't that great? Let's, so I'd love for you maybe just to give us an example of some of the young people you make, of course, without exposing any, any uh, you know, confidential information, but just an example of how you've seen some young people or families that you've worked with, how they've moved from one place to another, just to give people a sense of yeah. like, you know, this really does over time help restore and create healing. Yeah. It can be such a subtle shift. Um, I think of one girl that I work with who really has gone through some things that no person should go through and has been hurt in many different ways. Um, and who, you know, the, when I was talking about the relational effects, those are really present for her, where she has difficulty trusting anyone and where she tries to run away from relationships and, and physically run away from secure places because those aren't places that she's been able to trust in the past not to hurt her. And so, you know, she walks through the world expecting that she needs to take care of herself and that she can't expect anyone else to take care of her. And when I started working with her, a lot of the work was just establishing a relationship because that was where the hurt was. And for her to be able to know that she could expect me to be there every week and that we would, you know, ride together in my car and we would go get a meal and, um, and that she could expect me to be present with her whether she wanted to talk to me or not, you know, whether she uh, wanted to talk about what had happened this week or whether she wanted to talk about what had happened in the past or whether she just wanted to sit in silence or listen to music. The being with her was the work and is the work. And, and the shifts that I see are that, you know, she might say goodbye to me at the end of a session now as opposed to just leaving the car. Or uh, she might, you know, she... <laughs> Which, which can't be minimized. It's really important because what it is is that she's recognizing that we're in a re relationship together, which is something that was so scary for her. Let's thank God for that. Let's thank God for that. Jeannie, tell us then how, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to have you close us with a mindfulness, with a mindfulness exercise, about, about two or three minutes, she said. A amen, because we still got to do some other things today, praise God. <laughs> but, but Jeannie, tell us a little bit of how, how do you imagine in your um, mind, um, how our congregation, how people here, how you and Hannah and others who have mental health uh, training or needs, how we can be more supportive of one another. How, how would you uh, imagine we can do that and how can people be in touch with you and Jaslyn and Hannah and others here in our congregation to help support that? That's a really good question. I'm a firm believer of starting in the home, you know, with your family, with your loved ones checking in. And when you say, how are you? You know, um, you may want to just stop for a moment and know how are you really, you know, um, or keep, keep hold someone in mind. I think what Dr. Hannah does with her kids is she holds them in their mind. Like for the next week, oh, you had that exam, how did it go? Oh, you had that job interview, how did that go? Or thinking ahead for someone, oh, you're going through a divorce, how can I... Um, you know, support you. Um, people tend to, you know, buck up and kind of hold their uh, stress or their pain in silence. And so just tuning in to kind of nuances of people's behavior, you know, is their face 
is, do you notice they're not smiling? Do you notice their, their eyes are downcast? Those are things you can clue in about your loved one, into your loved ones to, to, to notice that there may be something going on. Um, you know, I think it's, it's great that in the Bay Area, we have quite a few of clinicians who are sensitive to multiculturalism and diversity. So it's important to find the right provider who suits your values and your personality. It may require shopping around a little bit. Most people have some sort of health care. So, you know, you, you, I, I know myself when I was going through something in college, it took me quite a few therapists till I found someone who, who, who I felt comfortable with. It took, it took us a few therapists too. I think someone's still trying to figure out how to deal with me, amen. But I'm still on the market shopping. And, uh, and you, all, you all will definitely help us, help people who need referrals and, and, and to get, get in a good place, yeah? All right, great. Well, we're going to let Jonathan lead us in a, in a short mindfulness exercise. So the floor is yours. So if I just invite folks to have a relaxed spine by sh taking your shoulders, relaxing your shoulders over your hips and your ears over your shoulders. We'll just begin with some movement first, some mindful movement before we go into a breathing practice. So if I put down the mic, actually, may I use the mic stand? Yep. Okay, thanks. So let's just go ahead and have our, our hands on our shoulders, I mean on, on our laps. And then we're just going to go ahead and begin moving our body with our breath. So on the next inhalation, draw the shoulders back and lift your chest towards the sky, bringing your shoulder blades together, breathing in. And then when we exhale, roll your shoulders forward and then bring your chin towards your chest. Breathing in, shoulders back, lifting the heart up. And then exhale, roll your shoulders forward, and then bring your chin towards your chest. Let's do this two more rounds, noticing the sensations in your shoulders. Breathing in, feeling your shoulders. Exhaling, rolling forward, feeling your neck. Breathing in, shoulders back. And exhaling, rolling shoulders forward, chin to chest. Just go ahead and inhale, come back to neutral. And then exhale, relax and release. So just take a moment to pause and feel, and just notice what you're, what's happening in your shoulders, what sensations you're feeling in your shoulders from doing that movement. Maybe tingling, maybe pulsing, maybe some heat. Maybe no sensation at all, but just noticing. Cool. And then if, you're, if it feels okay with your eyes closed or halfway closed, you can either have your eyes closed or look downwards towards the floor. And just begin noticing your breath. Just simply bringing awareness to your own breathing. Just noticing your breath when you inhale. And notice your breath when you exhale. And if it feels okay, bringing one hand to your chest and then one hand to your belly, if it feels okay. And as you're breathing, just notice which areas of your body are moving as you breathe. You might notice your shoulders moving. Maybe your chest, maybe your belly. Maybe your arms are moving. And if you're not noticing any movement, no big deal. Just continue keeping your awareness on your breathing. And on the next inhalation, allow your belly to expand like a balloon on all sides when you breathe in, pushing, in, pushing into your hand. And then as you breathe out, let your belly relax towards your spine. Breathing in, the belly expands like a balloon. And then breathing out, the belly relaxes towards your spine. Continue for three rounds at your own pace, letting your belly move with your breath. 
you can keep your hands here where they're at or if you want to relax them back on your legs you can just doing whatever feels good for you After those three rounds, if your hands are still at your body, you can go ahead and relax your hands if you like. And just continue noticing the breath as it moves in and out, noticing how it feels, noticing how the body feels. And then after your next exhalation, going ahead and slowly coming back to into the room if your eyes are closed or halfway closed. All right. Thanks for being open to that practice. Just want to go ahead and share just a little bit of a taste of the practice using mindful movement, mindful breathing, and mindful centering. Let's appreciate this awesome panel, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so turn with me in your Bible. I'm going to do an abbreviated sermon this morning, just kind of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, tying in our final uh, season or session or uh, talk related to our, related to our on-ramp series. And uh, I am excited uh, to uh, really uh, get us in a place, hopefully, where we can indeed uh, be people who are not only on-ramped in our uh, relationship with God, but also connected here in our relationship uh, here at The Way. So uh, hopefully this will uh, translate well, and uh, we'll get an opportunity here to uh, go through these slides in the name of the Lord. Let's see, is this going to work? Good. Nope. Mm -mm -mm. See how that devil just be all in my... All right. So you may have to turn in your Bibles because this may look a little uh, 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 not cooperative, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. John chapter 16 is where we're heading. John chapter 16, verse number one through four. We're going to spend uh, the first part of our our uh, reading of the scripture, uh, just kind of giving a little bit of a context. The book of John, of course, is uh, one of the gospels, the four gospels. It is the gospel that is uh, a real unique record and account of the ministry and the life of Jesus. It is written by the apostle John. John was uh, one of the youngest of all of the disciples who followed Jesus. He came and followed Jesus really as a teenager, a, a pretty young teenager. Many people think is the youngest, 15, 16 years old. So John was there and he seems to have outlived all of the other disciples. So this is a record of John's gospel, what John saw, what John heard, and uh, these particular uh, uh, verses that we're reading are a part of what is called uh, Jesus' passion um, and uh, preparation for his passion, John 14 through 16. He's giving his disciples some of their uh, final marching orders. Now, many of you know for the last several weeks we've been preaching and teaching about the Holy Spirit. This is one of these uh, such passages where John goes in depth about the Holy Spirit and the way that the Holy Spirit will be a, a guide and a friend. In the Greek, it's called paraclete. It will be, he will be the, the one who will uh, be there with us as a consistent presence in our lives. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad Jesus cares enough about us to prepare us for uh, these seasons and transitions in our lives. Lives. And uh, John is uh, powerfully capturing some of the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. And uh, I think it will help contextualize our sermon today on blind spots. So let's go verse number one through four, John chapter 16, verse one through four. It says, I've told you, this is Jesus speaking, I've told you these things to prepare you for rough times ahead. For they are going to throw you out of the meeting places. 
There will even come a time when anyone who kills you will think they're doing God a favor. They will do these things because they never really understood the Father. I've told you these things so that when the time comes and they start in on you, you'll be well warned and ready for them. My God, thank God for Jesus for that warning. Amen. So y'all just get ready this week. You may have some kind of a week coming down the pike. Go down to verse number 12. Jesus continues to speak. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend or the Holy Spirit or the paraclete comes, the spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. The Holy Spirit won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about to happen and indeed out of all that I have done and said. The Holy Spirit will honor me. The Holy Spirit will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. That is why I've said he takes from me and delivers to you. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak uh, again from this topic, blind spots, how to overcome or deal with your blind spots. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the word of God that has been read for us. The people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. All right. Now, if you are a driver, a regular driver, you know that blind spots are an important part of defensive and safe driving. Because how many of you know you can be driving or how many of you know folk uh, in your morning commute and uh, you have an experience where you are driving next to them and all of a sudden they just start merging on top of you? Anybody ever had that kind of experience? And I'm sure you quote a scripture. I'm sure you, you do all kinds of things to, to, to try to help them find themselves. Amen. Uh, some of us feel like that's why our, our horns were made, right? To, to help jar you back into right driving your lane. Uh, and and, and, and uh, if you are uh, aware as you're driving that the mirrors that are around you, even though you may use them very well, they don't always cover every part of your periphery. They don't give you 360 degree coverage. Hello, somebody. So in order for you and I, if you're a good driver, to be able to deal with blind spots, you have to do a couple of techniques and, you know, I don't know, maybe helping some of y'all, uh, you know, that, you know, have high insurance for various reasons or another, uh, that when you're driving and you need to be mindful of blind spots, what do you have to do? Just quick glance. It's a quick over the shoulder glance. Hello, somebody. It's not a long glance where you like, and how many of you know, I used to drive like that. My dad, you know, when he was teaching me how to drive, uh, he was always very nervous because whenever I tried to take a, a look at my blind spot, I was aware of it, but too much of a stare in my blind spot would actually do more damage than me just not even paying attention to it at all. <laughs> Hello, somebody. That in order for you and I to actually be able to do what we need to do as it relates to addressing our blind spots, we can't be fixated on it, nor can we ignore it. I want to argue that you have to pay enough attention to it to acknowledge it so you can address it, but you can't fixate on those parts of your lives that are often underdeveloped. Hello, somebody. Fixation is not going to get you over 
those blind spots. But quick glances and attention will help you and I be able to move beyond some of the limitations that our vision will not always be able to account for unless we take some extra precautions. I find this to be an important point and particularly as we're talking and thinking about how God is seeking to allow the spirit of Jesus that has been left to us, the body of Christ, the followers of Jesus, the church, the spirit is here to help us pay necessary attention to our blind spots. And I want you to appreciate, my brothers and sisters, that all of us have blind spots. None of us have a, a, a perfect kind of, of awareness or sixth sense or third eye where we don't have to give necessary attention to our blind spots. Just like you get in a car, every day you drive, you don't get so good that you don't have to pay attention to your blind spots. Hello, somebody. I mean, you can drive like that, but you'll end up in a wreck after a while. That blind spots are a part of what it means. I want to argue to you today what it means to be human. It means that you can't see, know everything. Touch your name and tell them you don't know everything. Amen. I, I know some of y'all, that's painful. <laughs> I know it's painful for some of us. Amen. Because we, 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 we have built our lives on this idea that we know it all. Hello. That God consults us when God gets confused. When God forgets what God did, God be like, let me call McBride because, of course, McBride knows everything. Anybody been around somebody that felt like they know everything? Anybody been in a relationship with someone that felt like they knew everything? Anyone sat and talked to someone who felt like they knew everything? Don't it make you not even want to talk to them no more? Because it's interesting, you know everything except that you don't know everything. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, don't you be that person. Don't you be that person. Don't you be someone on your job that does not recognize your blind spots. Don't you be someone in your family that doesn't recognize your blind spots. Don't you be someone working for justice that doesn't recognize you have blind spots. There is only one who has no blind spots and that God is the God of our salvation. And that's why we worship this God. Because this God does not need our consultation. Hello, somebody. Again, I, I, I was, I was, you know, doing one of the one of the uh, 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 invocations for our dear brother who's running for a city council here in the city of Berkeley. And you know, I, I'm 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 one of these, you know, uh, I become, I guess, known as a little bit of a radical uh, preacher guy. And you know, I, I I remember while I was up there talking yesterday, I told him, you know, I know a lot of y'all in here don't believe in God, but that's okay. You better thank God I believe in God. Amen. Because if I didn't believe in God, I'd be a piece of work. I'd be more of a piece of work. Amen. Because <laughs> because my my mind, my intellect, my 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 will, I would try to impose it on everybody. And some of that would be violent. Some of that would be uncompromising. But God, because I know God knows more than me, God has me on a nice little leash, you know. God kind of like a little junkyard dog, you know, junkyard dog be running, you know, just like thinking it go so far. God, I'm just trying to tell you that some of us better really trust that we have blind spots and we need God to help us deal with our blind spots. So if you're going to overcome your blind spots, the first thing I think this scripture tells you and I is that we have to let God take the wheel. Somebody say, take the wheel, Jesus. Amen. We need to free ourselves as we're going through this journey of life from Feeling like we need 
to have ultimate control over everything that is happening. Verse 13, Jesus tells the disciples that the Spirit is coming to take you by the hand and lead you. And some of us need to be very open to Jesus taking the wheel. The Spirit leading us through these places where we do not know where these blind spots are. I don't know about you, but I appreciate the promises of God's word. In I believe it's Psalms 91, verse, verse number 10. It says, because you have made the Lord your refuge, you've made the Lord your most high dwelling, no evil will befall you, no scourge come near your tent, for God will command angels concerning you to guard you in all their ways, in all your ways, and on their hands they will bear you up so you will not dash your foot against a stone. What is God saying? God is saying that if you let me have control of your life, I will help navigate and guide you through some of these seasons that are meant or have the potential to destroy you. God says, I will help you get through them. You may have to cry a little bit and you may have to suffer a little bit, but dashing your foot, your head against the stone will not be a fatal experience when you allow God to take the wheel. Understand that allowing God to take the wheel for many of us indeed is a blind spot. Because this tug of war we have with God, with ourselves, with the experiences that are happening in our lives, how many of you know sometimes we got to convince ourselves <laughs> that God all power belongs to you. I know that this situation is deeply problematic and troubling, but I need to remind myself that all power belongs to God. God said it. The scripture, it, it says it, uh, I think it's Psalms uh, 90 or 62. It says, uh, God has spoken this once. Twice have I heard it. All the power belongs to God. And if all power belongs to God, my brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that it is our duty, it is a blessing to be able to recognize, Lord, I need you to take control over these situations I'm dealing with. There are some situations that are going to come your way that will remind you of your limits remind you of your blind spots, that all the degrees we have, all the friends we have, all the cultural pride and national power we have, how many of you know there is a situation that will come our way that will remind us, man, I better take a quick look over my shoulder because I think I'm going in a path, in a way that is no danger, but I need to be aware of some of these blind spots. Let's see. So, what would be some questions? Well, you can't see those questions. So, I'll read the questions. What blind spots exist in your life which require the Spirit to take the wheel? What are some situations in your life that require the Spirit to take the wheel? How can you be thoughtful about the areas in your life that you know you need someone greater than yourself to help support your wellness, your healing, your journey towards God's power in your life? Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need God to take the wheel. I need God to take the wheel. The second thing, if you're going to be uh, someone who overcomes blind spots, you have to be open to hard truths. Open to hard truths. 
I am someone who does not like the hard truth. I actually would prefer an easy lie. <laughs> Trying to talk to y'all like, like, like we all real up in here today. How many of you would rather hear an easy lie than a hard truth at least half of the time? Maybe not all the time. Thank God. All right. Hello, somebody, right? We, we, the truth is hard. I think that's what Jack Nicholson said. You can't handle the truth because sometimes the truth is hard. And yet, Jesus told his disciples that this Holy Spirit I've put inside of you that I'm sending will lead and guide you into all the truth there is. Not the truth you like. Not the truth that you feel like you can handle, but all of the truth. And how many of you know there's a whole lot of truth in this world folk don't want to have to wrestle with? If we are taking seriously this idea of trauma, don't you know that in the history of our country, there's a lot of ugly truth that has been embedded in our social structures that we have to contend with or else those hard truths will continue to assault our psyche, our bodies, and our communities. The hard truth of the genocides we have done to the indigenous people of this land a hard truth. And I was I was going to watch X Men over there at Emeryville, and uh, and I was you know reminded that the whole Emery Bay is a burial ground for the Ohlone tribe who inhabited this region, and the ugly truth is that when they were trying to build that, the Ohlone descendants who still were alive today were protesting and saying, you are desecrating our holy burial sites. Can you imagine if somebody was trying to like build, I don't know, a Victoria's Secret or a gap on top of your mama's grave? I don't know if you'd be like, oh, that's okay. She, you know, she's not here no more. Ugly truths. Can you imagine the trauma that some of our indigenous people in this country carry with them knowing that we have malls and homes and houses of worship and political centers all on the lands that their people have rightful claim to? Some of us who, who come through uh, the worst of slavery or Jim Crow uh, during the, 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 the world wars, we had internment camps here in the United States for, for folk who people thought were Japanese. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Hey Amen. You know, it ain't just this idea where, you know, everybody think all black folk look alike. Hello, somebody. We round folk up and group them into these categories and put on them all kinds of ugly lies and, and treat them terribly. Ugly truths, we have to face the hard truths. Why? Because whether we face the truths or not, as was rightfully told to us earlier, the trauma lives in our bones and our tissues. And we can't be healed if we're not willing to wrestle with the ugly truth. The Spirit, I believe, will help guide us through those ugly truths or hard truths that we have to deal with. You and I, as followers of Jesus, must avoid being a historical in the ways in which we interact in the world. Why? Because if we don't have a memory of the ways in which we have fallen or succumb to our failed humanity, we can reinscribe the very same thing to other people. Because of our blind spots. Think about this. It is no mistake 
least in my family, my, my parents and my, my grandparents, my grandparents, both sides of my parents' families were uh, abusive physically. Even there was some sexual abuse in our families. And, and my parents, when they got married, they, this is what they told us. They sat us all down when we were of a certain age and they said, we want to give you our history. This person was sexually abused by this person. This person beat this person. This person tried to slit this person's throat. And we want you to know this because this is your history. This person was an alcoholic. So you need to know all this so you can have the ability when these feelings and emotions and temptations that you don't know where they're coming from start to rise up inside of you, you can at least know, all right, there's some, something going on here that I need to be aware of. And then my parents told us this, we, our family will break that cycle. But you gotta, I, you know, I thank God for my mom and my dad. They are old school about pretty much everything. <laughs> and I thank God that they had enough honesty and awareness about their blind spots, the blind spots of my family to help me and us know them so we can be aware of them. In our country's history, all kinds of terrible tragedies have happened. And our country wants to misremember history, right? Uh, we can ready to help do this uh, curriculum, hopefully social impact campaign for the birth of a nation. Uh, the, the, and it's, it's going to be something. Amen. Because it's about Nat Turner who said he had a vision from God to go out and kill the slave uh, master and all their family. Amen. And, you know, I know a lot of us are probably uncomfortable with God giving us a vision like that. Amen. But some folks seem to feel all right with the slave masters then killing all the, the slaves. <laughs> And it didn't seem like, you know, there was any problems with that. But anyway, we're going to unpack that <laughs> in the movie. But I was in watching the X-Men, and they had this new movie coming out with Matthew McConaughey, some free state of Jones or something. Of course, you got this one great slave owner who had to help liberate all these slaves. And that's the story they'd rather tell because our country wants to misremember history. Hello, somebody. And see, part of our job is to not have a bad memory. And the way you don't have a bad memory, I believe, this is what I, I, I try to be trying to argue some of my meetings from the White House all the way down to the outhouse. We have to acknowledge the harm. You should write this down because this will help you. But I think this is a great social pathway to addressing the hard truths, the blind spots, the harm we've done, you have to acknowledge the harm. You have to repair what's been broken, and then you have to restore what's been lost. Acknowledge harm, repair what's been broken, restore what's been lost. In one word, you know, that just called reparations. Touch your neighbor, somebody. Now, nobody won't talk about no reparations up in here. But part of why I believe reparations is an important part of what it means to wrestle with the hard truths is that it helps us tell a story. It helps us remember the same history and it helps us acknowledge our collective complicity. When you want to just erase history, well, I'm just here today. I wasn't there. I wasn't here back then. And you got all kind of folk: black, white, brown, rich, poor, uh, 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 powerful, no power. We just need to move on. I wish I could move on, but I got this stuff in my tissues. I have the lingering effect of this in my relationship. 
My family got all this drama and we talking about moving on, but every time I see you, I'm reliving the same pain. Why? Because I can't handle the hard truths. That creates a blind spot. But the Spirit is there to guide and lead us. It's all true. So, what is this next question? How does the hard truth keep you from addressing your blind spots? So, I gave you a concrete example of us and our family, right? And, you know, uh, I can give you a, a really cool example in Scripture, too. You know, there, there was all kinds of stigma associated with Mary being pregnant before she knew Joseph, before she married Joseph. If the angel did not come and visit Joseph, his blind spot would have took over. Be like, no, I, no, 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 this is, I'm not going to have this kind of story in my family. But the spirit showed up through the angel through the word of God to illuminate this blind spot. Really, this blind spot ain't nothing but information you don't have. The perspective you need, the courage you are required to have in order to move forward. Ask God, Lord, what is the blind spot, the hard truth that I have to address? And how can I resist being ahistorical about my own self, my family, my society, Lord, let your spirit do more than just help me speak in tongues, swing from the chandeliers, run, dance, and shout. But help your spirit, allow your spirit to also help lead and guide me into the truths of healing and wholeness. What are some ways you can do that? Accountability partners. Some of us need to get some, and I'm talking about accountability partners that are filled with God. Not filled with everything else. Not on this. You can have him when you trying to like party or watch the game or, you know, watch Scandal or go to the Beehive concert. You can have your friends for that. But listen, when, when you trying to get your blind spots dealt with, you better find you somebody who's got some godly counsel. Folk who been through a few things. A therapist. Find you somebody that you can lay on their couch and, and they could give you all the, everything you need. Just, I need help. I need healing. I need wholeness. I need to tell you what happened to me way back when. Whew, man, that was a little more exercise than I thought I was going to have to do. Preaching and teaching. Prayer. These are all tools to help you deal with your blind spots. And then the last thing we'll say this morning is that you will get victory over blind spots as you accept God's delivery. I love this verse. It's such a powerful verse. Verse number 16, 15, it says that the Spirit will glorify me because the Spirit will take what is mine and deliver it to you. Think about that. You got, we got our own FedEx. Deliver them from heaven. That will deliver to us what we need in order to overcome our blind spots. I hope I'm helping somebody today. We have access to the delivery system of God. Where I don't have to live bound by my blind spots. God says that I've sent the Spirit to help you get everything you need to overcome these blind spots in your life. So you're not having to live in a hopeless situation because you're acknowledging you have blind spots. Sometimes, you know, when you start to acknowledge things, how many of you know sometimes it can feel like you're opening up a new prison cell for yourself? It's like, man, I'm just, I'm just trying to be free, Pastor. I'm trying to keep all that stuff buried. Because if I keep it buried, I ain't got to deal with it. But I think it's even Freud who says, that which is repressed 
will eventually come to the surface. Ain't enough dirt <laughs> in heaven, hell, earth that you can put on top of your trauma, your struggles, your blind spots where it won't eventually break through. So in due time and process, what does it mean for you to accept God's delivery? God says, I will deliver to you through the power of the Spirit that which you need to overcome these blind spots. That's good news. That's real good news. Not only for you, but for your family, for your marriage, for this community, for this country, for this world. That God is not just leaving us to our own devices. God is not just leaving you to your own power. But God is saying, if you cooperate with me, if you open yourself up to me in the ways that I am laying out, listen, I will give you the courage you need in order to engage those practices that bring about your healing. So some of us, the reason why we're so skittish about some of this is because we're not always tracking God's delivery. How many of you, uh, we, I, I, I mailed some stuff that we bought over in Palestine and, and, you know, I was trying to get it mailed here because on my way back from Palestine, you know, going through the airports, you know, they, they don't play. And I'll tell you a little bit about it later, but you know, they, they, they have a ranking system for your passport, one all the way to six. And that determines if they'll let you back in the country based off of how you leave. So one is for the Israeli citizen, and six is for usually the Palestinian or the, the foreigner that they are very suspicious of, and they're not going to let you back in their country. So you got to be careful how you leave, what you leave with. I can preach that a whole nother day. But the reason I brought that up, I had to ship all kind of stuff home. Because, you know, one of the Palestinian artists gave me this big old picture. It was a great picture, and I knew they was probably going to sweat me on that. So as I shipped it, they gave me a tracking number. Why? Because it may take a few weeks and it has to go from Palestine to the Israeli port to the U.S. customs to then this area. And it was like, we just want to give you a tracking number. So just in case it seems like it's taking too long, you can always type in the number and you'll know exactly where it is. Some of us need to get some tracking numbers for God's delivery of what we are needing God to do. What is a tracking number? The scriptures, the promises of God. When it's taking too long, do you have the right promise of God in your mind to help you wait while it's taking too long? Or are you listening to all these other haters on the side? See, I told you, you know all that stuff you're doing, it don't work. You just do it this on. No, no, no. I will trust in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not to my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge God so God can direct my paths. That's my tracking number to just hold on a little while longer. I know people are coming against me, but I, I remember hearing this, this song, this principle from my grandma and them that said that victory shall be mine if I hold my peace. Let the Lord fight my battle. Victory shall be mine. So why are you telling me go out here and knock somebody in the mouth? I'm just going to be like, be like what, what the prophet told Jehoshaphat. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord. So I'm just going to show up to the battlefield and let God handle my lightweight. Hello, somebody. When I have trouble in my mind, I'm not going to be sitting here being content with trouble in my mind when the tracking number, the promise of God says that God will keep us in perfect peace. If we keep our mind focused on him, I may have sickness in my body, sickness in my soul, sickness in my spirit, but the scriptures remind me that I can pray to the one who heals all my iniquities. Are you following these tracking numbers? If you're in need of salvation, the tracking number of God's word says, 
if you call on me, I will answer with salvation for that which you're asking for. These are the mechanisms and the tools we have access to if we're going to overcome the blind spots in our lives. And my brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you today that this is part of what we must do regularly. The trauma, the assault on our being, on our soul, is persistent and consistent across generation, across time, across place, across color. Black folk, white folk, Asian folk, Latino folk, indigenous folk, rich, poor, uh, uh, wealthy, uh, powerful, powerless, gay, straight, transgender, American, Palestinian, Jewish. Trauma does not discriminate. So it's up to us as a part of our spiritual practice, as a part of our discipleship of following Jesus to pay attention to the blind spots. So we may experience healing and wholeness. Come on, let's stand together and let's take a few moments to respond.